We have waited already too long. Thank you, Mikko. The stage is yours. Thank you. Thank you very much for the kind introduction. Thank you for inviting me. And most importantly, thank you for coming today. Today we will be speaking about the state of security, the cyber arms race, the world where we are in today, where we are coming from and where we are going. My name is Mikko and I hunt hackers. That's my job. I hunt the bad hackers, the evil ones, not the good ones, not the white hat hackers, of course, the bad ones, the criminals, the ones who run the botnets, send the spam, write the malwares, infect our systems and try to steal our money. And I've spent my whole life trying to defend people's online security and online privacy. And I do feel like I'm a dinosaur, because I'm getting old. I am older than the internet, all right? I am older than the internet. Two years ago, I was lecturing at the Stanford University in California. My lecture was in a building called the William Gates Building, and it's called the William Gates Building because Bill Gates donated the money to build the building. And in the lobby of the William Gates building, there's a sign on the wall memorizing the birth of the TCP IP network protocol, which was designed and created in Stanford University by Wint Cerf and his colleagues. And the time they have printed on that sign on the wall is December 1969. And I was born in October 1969. So I am older than TCP IP, and TCP IP is what then became the Internet. So I think 1969 was a pretty cool year, because we had Woodstock, the rock and roll event. We had the birth of the Internet, and I was born. I especially liked the last part. And time goes by really, really fast. It feel, to me, it feels like it was just you know, a couple of years ago when we were still analyzing viruses which looked like this. I still keep on carrying an infected floppy disk with me always to remind myself about where I'm coming from. Because this is where I started from. I started by analyzing viruses spreading on these. And there are some people in the audience looking at these like, what the hell is that? This is how we moved data before the internet, all right? Before internet was commonplace, before internet was everywhere. This is how we moved data. You had to actually physically walk from one machine to another to move the data. And it seems like a joke now that viruses and malware could spread around the world on these, but they did spread around the world on these. Even though you had to physically carry them from one country to another, we did. And they did go worldwide. And if this feels like it just happened, and it was 25 years ago, another thing feels even more closer to me. Because I remember in spring 2007, 10 years ago, when I was working in our labs in Helsinki, when we then started getting messages from our colleagues and friends here in Tallinn about how sites were not working correctly. We all remember the denial of service attacks that we were witnessing 10 years ago. I'm quite confident that all of you were witnessing them 10 years ago. I don't think there are any nine-year-olds in the audience. I took this GIF 10 years ago. I was just going through different ministry or public websites, like the police website of Estonia, trying to load them, trying to see which one of them worked and which one of them didn't. And quite, quite many of them didn't. And the ones which did work were typically very slow. Here's another chart I took 10 years ago. This is the outage data of, uh, well, in this case, vm.ee. 
ministry side. The red part of the chart means that the outage is active, site doesn't respond. And this was a historical event. For the first time ever, infrastructure of a whole country was under attack. For the first time ever, real-world riots expanded from the real world to the online world. Since then, we have seen this phenomenon happen over and over again. The internet is changing our lives. Everything in our society is now dependent on the internet. And you can shape the society through the internet. You can shape the society through the internet. You can shape it in good ways and you can shape it in bad ways. A great example on how you can shape the society through the internet is what happened in the United States a couple of months ago. The end result of, of the US presidential elections was shaped by the internet. And I'm not only referring to the hacked emails and them being leaked by the Russians to try to sway the public opinion against Secretary Clinton. I'm also referring to the fact that today, thanks to social media like Facebook, for the first time ever, election campaigners can pinpoint different people who are voting, figure out what these people like, even more importantly, figure out what they don't like, and then give them unique ads and unique news to shape their opinion. And this has never before been possible. Traditionally, when we have elections, the campaigners advertise themselves in the newspapers, by the road signs, maybe on TV. And when you do that, everybody sees the same ads. Every single voter sees the same message. But when we move that from the real world to the internet, then potentially everybody sees a different message. The ads you see online are tailor-made for you. And most people still think that everyone sees the same ad. And they don't realize that the only one who sees the ad is themselves. And the reason why they see this ad is that a bot figured out that this kind of ad might shape your opinion based on who you are, which can be deducted from your social media profile. And this, I believe, is dangerous. In fact, I believe that we should not allow election campaigning on social media at all. I think it should be banned. I think it's a bad idea. I think it's a dangerous idea. As long as everybody who votes sees the same message, I see no problem. But when the message is tailor-made to shape the opinions of independent voters, that's not good. This is dangerous and it's probably a bad idea. So, internet brings us problems, right? Of course it brings us problems. But, internet gives us benefits as well. And I think we would all agree that internet has brought us more good things than bad things. It has brought us bad things. Bad things like you know, online criminals who can be anywhere in the world. Before the internet, you only had to worry about the criminals who were close to you. Now you have to worry about the criminals who can be anywhere. So yes, we have new problems, we have new risks, but the upsides are so much bigger than the downsides. But sometimes I do worry about the future. And sometimes, sometimes I freak out myself. I'll give you an example. There's this Tom Cruise movie from 15 years ago called Minority Report, which has a segment in which the Mr. Anderson, I believe, or Anderton, Tom Cruise is playing a guy called Anderton, is walking through a mall, and every single ad around him changes and addresses him directly, by name, because they detect automatically who is he and what he likes. Maybe he likes a beer right now because he's thirsty. 
This is a science fiction movie. Last week on Thursday, I was on a business trip in Denmark. I landed to Copenhagen airport. I got out of my plane. I walked for one minute and then I saw an ad which wished me welcome to Copenhagen by name. <laughs> and I was a little bit freaked out, I'll, I'll, I'll be honest. I was like, holy hell, like, what is this shit? And I was like checking, do I have my Bluetooth on or, you know, am I, am I broadcasting my presence? Well, turns out that, uh, well, I was going to a conference and the conference organizers had booked my flight so they knew when I was landing. So they had bought the ads in the whole airport for the half an hour window when I was landing. <laughs> it still freaked me out though. I did feel like we're sort of Living in the future. Living in the future, that is a first. But that's, that's the kind of world that most likely is ahead of us. The things that we see in science fiction movies sometimes turn out to be reality. That's why people are so freaked out about phenomenons like general artificial intelligence. Because when they think about general artificial intelligence, they think about Terminator 2 which is a, it's a possible outcome. If we are able to generate a superior intelligence, if we are able to build up technology which will move us from the most intelligent species on the planet to the second most intelligent species on the planet, then we are no longer in charge. And then we don't actually know what's going to happen. It could turn out to be Terminator 2, or it could be turn out to be great. You know, artificial intelligence with superior intelligence, which gets more intelligent every second, could, in theory, solve all of our problems. Solve world hunger, solve poverty, solve energy crises, solve pollution. These would be trivial problems for a superior intelligence. We can't solve them. A superior intelligence could. But then again, a superior intelligence, if they don't like us, or if it doesn't like us, it could do whatever it wants to us. So the crucial thing about the upcoming artificial intelligence revolution is that when we cross the threshold, when we go from being the smartest to the second smartest, we have to be very careful about that particular moment, because we can no longer go back. When we are number two, we can never become number one again. So we have to be really careful about how we do the transition. We only get one shot. We only get one try. And if we get it wrong, it can be really, really bad. If we get it right, it can be really, really good. And what worries me about this race to create artificial intelligence is that it is a race. IBM wants to be the first. Google wants to be the first. Facebook wants to be the first. Apple wants to be the first. And when you are in a race, when you try to be your competitor, you don't stop and consider carefully about how you do the transition. This is what worries me about the upcoming artificial intelligence revolution. The good part about superior intelligence is that it would solve our computer security problems permanently. Because Almost all of the security problems we have are coming from vulnerabilities. We have two kinds of problems in computer security. It's either users doing stupid sh stuff or vulnerabilities in the programs. We have a brand new example of a vulnerability. Microsoft Office, the latest version of Office, has a zero-day vulnerability right now. It was found yesterday. There's no patch available. If you run Word, Excel, or PowerPoint, you are vulnerable right now, today. If you open up an attack file, it will be able to infect your system, and there's almost nothing you can do about it. You can try to run Word in a special mode, but it's, it's kind of hard. We expect Microsoft to patch this tomorrow. We, tomorrow is a patch Tuesday. With any luck, they will patch it then. 
but it's an example of vulnerabilities. And, and that's not a user error. It's not the user doing stupid stuff. It's, it's, it's a bug. It's a bug in the program. Because that's what vulnerabilities are. Vulnerabilities are bugs. Programming errors. Why do we have bugs? Because programmers make mistakes. Why do programmers make mistakes? Because they are human beings, and humans make mistakes. So the solution is obvious. Let's get rid of humans. Let's get rid of human programmers. Let's stop writing programs with programmers. Instead, let's write a programming program. And let's make it so good that it's better than human programmers. Let's make it so it can program itself. It can make a better version of itself. And eventually, it might take decades, but eventually you could imagine a self-programming program which would replace all the programmers. Which means every single programmer would immediately be out of a job. How many programmers in the audience? Sorry. I'm one of them, so. But if this would actually happen, if we would have not general artificial intelligence, but let's say programming artificial intelligence, which is superior to us and which is able to make itself better, you could imagine that, you know, it would eventually be so good that it wouldn't make bugs. There would be no bugs. There would be no vulnerabilities. Or if there would be bugs, they would be so complex, so complicated that there would be no way to exploit them. We humans couldn't exploit them because the bugs would be so complex because they are done by a superior intelligence. If this sounds like a science fiction to you, maybe it is. But I don't believe so. I, in fact, I believe that we will still see technologies like this during our lifetime. And our lifetimes have been extraordinarily exciting. I do realize that we have people in the audience who are in their 20s and people in their audience in their 60s, maybe 70s. So we have a wide range of people. But we've all been alive for at least 20 years. And during those 20 years, we saw a massive revolution. Yes, the internet and this TCP IP was invented already in 1969, but the revolution really only started with the web. And the web started in 1994. Because in April 1994, I set up the first website for F-Secure. And when I set up the first website for our company, Finland had 17 websites. All right, we were the 17th website in Finland. That's how early it was. It was typically some universities or places like that which had small websites. We had a one-page website in 1994. But that's when it started. That's 23 years ago. And that's nothing. That's a very quick change because during that time, during those 20 years, the way computers changed data completely changed. We didn't need these anymore. Today, every computer and every smartphone communicates over the Internet. There are no computers out there which wouldn't be on the Internet. Basically, that's, that's the way it is. So we saw that revolution. And now, next, we're going to see the next revolution, which is that everything else will go on the Internet. So far, it's only been the computers and the smartphones. Smartphones and tablets. Next, everything else. Factories, cars, fridges, lamps, projectors, watches. This is going to happen right now. It's, it, it has already started. So we get to see the revolution of the Internet. Now we're going to see the revolution of the Internet of Things. And with any luck, we still get to see the revolution of artificial intelligence. All of these happening during the same lifetime. And that's massive. Reminds me of this lady. I saw her being interviewed on French TV. And, and uh, this interview was done maybe in the 1980s. 
And she told how she saw the Wright brothers fly for the first time. Mankind, you know, flew for the first time in the 1920s. She was there. She saw it. And then in 1969, she was watching from TV as mankind went to the moon. So during one person's life, we, we, we started flying at all. And during the same lifetime, we went to the moon, which is remarkable. That's a pretty big change. But I think that's nothing compared to the changes we, our generations, are seeing right now. The mankind going online. The mankind's developments taking us way beyond to what we could have ever imagined. We've also seen us lose our privacy thanks to this internet revolution. Because we are not just the first generation that went online, we're also the first generation whose life can be monitored from beginning to the end, every moment. Because we are constantly reporting where we are, who are we close to, who are we communicating with? What are we communicating about? What are we interested in? We all report this all the time because we all carry tracking devices. These. We carry these on us all the time. We typically even sleep next to our tracking devices, don't we? Because we use them as our, our alarm clocks. And they constantly report to multiple different places about where you are and who, who you are close to. And by the way, I know for a fact that I am on a watch list of at least two different intelligence agencies. You are now in the same room with my tracking device. <laughs> Sorry. My fault. Should have put it into flight mode. So how do we start solving these challenges we have. I believe one part of the problem is that people and companies and organizations have a very abstract idea about who are behind the different online attacks. People are worried about you know, evil hackers coming and hacking my system. Evil hackers. Like, who are these evil hackers? Turns out there is no single unified group of hackers. Turns out that there's a quite wide range of different kinds of hackers. And they hack for different reasons. They target different targets for different motivations, using different tools, using different techniques, meaning that you fight them with different technologies. So the very first step any organization should do when they start to build up their security is to do a threat assessment of who we are, what do we do, who are we targeted by, and then start building their defenses when they have some notion of you know, what kind of hackers could be after us. Because it turns out that there's a quite range, wide range of groups, different kinds of groups that hack. We have white hat hackers, the guys on the left, Charlie Miller and Chris Valasek, guys who made the headlines when they crashed the, uh, hacked the Chrysler Jeep. I'm sure they also crashed the Chrysler Jeep. And made headlines because they were able to remotely take control of the engine, of the steering wheel, of the brake of the car. Which, by the way, was Charlie's car. I, 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 I know he sold that you're cheap by now. I, I really feel sorry for whoever bought Charlie's Jeep. But they didn't hack that car to cause harm. They didn't hack that car to steal. They didn't hack the car to kill people. No, no, no. They hacked that system so that they could tell Chrysler. And that's exactly what they did. And then Chrysler fixed it. This is what white hat hackers do. They hack to make things more secure. 
They hack so they can tell the vendors about the problems. They might do these hacks, like in this case, so that they could do interesting research, which they could then present at a conference. Or they might do it because there's a bug bounty. Bug bounties are these programs where companies pay hackers money when they hack their systems and then tell them how they did it. And by the way, we have a bug bounty. If you like hacking, but you don't want to go to jail, hack us. Because you have our permission, you have my permission. You're free to hack our system. And if you succeed, we will not call the cops, we will give you money. This is what bug bounties do. Why do we do this? Because we know that hackers are looking at our servers, at our systems, and at our software. And we know that there are vulnerabilities in our servers, in our systems, in our software. So when hackers find vulnerabilities, we want those hackers to tell us. We don't want them to tell someone else. Even more importantly, we want those hackers to sell that information to us. We don't want them to sell that information to someone else, like to a foreign intelligence agency. This is the way it works. This is why we run a bug bounty. This is why Google runs a bug bounty. This is why Apple and Microsoft run bug bounty. Bug bounties work. Bug bounties convert hackers to your side. I'm not going to lie, it's not easy. I mean, it generates a lot of extra work, but we believe it's worth it. Another added, added benefit from bug bounties that I like is that I often get young people coming to me asking for you know, tips and advice, and, and you can see that they are really you know, itching to you know, hack into some network. They really like to do it. But at the same time, they're worried about getting caught. And then when they get caught and they get sentenced, then they might not be able to get a job in computer security ever. So I'm really happy that we have these bug bounty systems. So we can tell these kids, that, yeah, go away, go away. Go and hack that company. It's okay. You have a permission. But if you find something, you have to tell them. That's the way it works. So Charlie and Chris, good hackers. Then we have group number two, bad hackers. Hackers who break the law. Group number two is hacktivists, like the anonymous movement. And these are people who do break the law, but they don't do it for personal benefit. They're not trying to steal money. They're trying to protest, just like people go on the street protesting about something that they don't agree with. And that makes them different from group number three, which is criminals. The ones who try to make money with their attacks. And this is the biggest problem we have. By far, the majority of the attacks we see are coming from group number three. Then we have governments, including foreign intelligence agencies, foreign militaries, even law enforcement. And then the last group is an upcoming group, extremists and terrorists. It's upcoming because we haven't yet seen cyber terrorism. And we should be happy that we haven't yet seen cyber terrorism. Because real world terror attacks are already very unpredictable. They make no sense. Like, why would anybody steal a truck and dr drive over people? It makes no sense. And exactly in the same way, cyber terror attacks, if we ever see them, will make no sense. Like, why would anybody do that? For all the other groups, we can understand why they hack. They all have a good motivation. We can sort of forecast or guess what kind of hacks they will make. But for extremists, who knows? Who the hell knows? I sure don't. Now, for companies, there's this misconception that when you get hacked, you might go bankrupt. And this almost never happens. Companies don't fold even if they get hacked. Even if they get really badly hacked, they typically recover. I've done a study on this. From all over the world, I was able to find only six companies which have gone bankrupt or have folded directly as a result of getting hacked. 
Now, don't get me wrong. Companies get hurt. Their stock value typically plummets. People get fired. CEOs get fired. CISOs get fired. CIOs get fired after a company gets hacked. But the companies typically survive. You think about the worst hacks like the Sony PlayStation Network or Sony Pictures or Secure uh, Payments or, you know, LinkedIn. They all survived, even though they had really bad breaches. But they do cost money. So how much does it cost a company when a company gets hacked? How much does it cost? Well, we actually have an answer to this question. Because last year, Yahoo got hacked. And in the middle, Yahoo was hacked in the middle of an uh, acquisition because Verizon was buying Yahoo. And while these negotiations were underway, they already had a price tag for Yahoo. And then Yahoo gets hacked. And then Yahoo has to drop the selling price by $350 million because they got hacked. The only reason they dropped the price is that they got hacked. They lost over a billion user accounts. Yahoo losing a billion user accounts creates a question. How the hell does Yahoo still have a billion users? Like, who are these people? But it, nevertheless, that's the price, track, price tag, $350 million. Which creates the question. Who caused this? Who is responsible for this? And the answer is this guy. This is Karim Baratov. Because he hacked Yahoo together with his friend Alexei. Karim is a Russian hacker living in Toronto. Or actually, right now, in a jail in Toronto. Waiting extradition to the United States to be tried for hacking Yahoo. And when we do investigations on cases like these, one thing we try to do is to find these actors online. Because it turns out that everybody has a Facebook page. Even criminals have a Facebook page. I, I work regularly with cops, and, and cops love Facebook and LinkedIn. Because all the criminals are there as well. I mean, real world, I mean, murderers and, 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 and you know, drug dealers, they, are, they also have Facebook pages. Because everybody has a Facebook page. Which is really, really useful for law enforcement. And it's really, really useful for us when we analyze hackers. Um, for Karim, for example, here's his Instagram. Where he, as everybody, posts pictures about his parties and his friends and shit. But he also posts pictures which sort of um, paint a picture of this guy. Like for example, that he likes cars. That's a Mercedes S-Class. That's an Aston Martin with the license plate called Mr. Karim. Here's another picture from his Instagram. That's car keys, two Mercedes, one Lambo, one Ferrari, and one Maserati. Here's a picture from his yard. That's a motherfucking Rolls Royce. And this reminds me of another hacker, another Russian hacker. Don't get me wrong, not all the hackers are Russians, because some of them are from Ukraine. <laughs> and that's a joke, because there's quite a few hackers coming from Estonia. We know because we've arrested several. Well, of course, we haven't arrested. We're not the police, but we do work with the police. Nevertheless, the case that this reminds me is the hack of LinkedIn. Now, I am not going to do a hands up, but if I would do a hands up on how many of you are on LinkedIn, most of you would raise your hands. And then if I would ask you how many of you were on LinkedIn five years ago, I'm guessing still most of you would raise your hands. I would, because I had a LinkedIn account in 2012, which means most of us were hacked in 2012, because LinkedIn was hacked in 2012. And the attacker stole 130 million LinkedIn accounts, including LinkedIn passwords and the email address you were using 
on LinkedIn in 2012. And this is, um, that's five years. This theft happened five years ago, but it only became public last summer. And also the database was leaked last summer. 130 million email addresses and 130 million passwords, which means we know who the victims were. I'm there because I used LinkedIn in 2012, but I was using a password manager already in 2012, so I had a long, strong and unique password on LinkedIn. So all I had to do was to change my LinkedIn password. But for many, many people, they had the same password everywhere. We've actually asked people, we've done questionnaires on this, we've asked people about their password use, and around 10% of people tell us that they use one password. And they don't mean one password, the password manager, they mean that they have only one password. They use the same password everywhere, which is a bad idea, but people do this. So, who's the Russian hacker who hacked LinkedIn? Well, it's this guy, Yevgeny, Yevgeny Nikolin. He's from Moscow. He's right now in Czech Republic. He's waiting extradition to uh, to United States. And when we look at the list of victims, the list of LinkedIn email addresses, one guy who we can find from the list is this guy, Mark, Mr. Zuckerberg. So this means we actually now know what is Mark Zuckerberg's LinkedIn password. His password is da da da. <laughs> and he used the same password everywhere. Everywhere except on Facebook, because all of his social media accounts were hacked last summer when this became public. His Facebook wasn't hacked. He had a different password on Facebook. I'm guessing his Facebook password is da-da-da-da. <laughs> and this is interesting, because we all know that he's a smart guy. I mean, he, he is Mark Zuckerberg. He's probably a genius. Yet, he does these basic mistakes that we all do. And we get back to what I said earlier. We have two kinds of problems. We have technical problems, and then we have people doing stupid stuff. And it's hard to fix people, because we can't patch brains. We can patch programs. We can't patch brains. It's, it's, it's hard making people change the way they use computers. So, how much money did Yevgeny make with the LinkedIn database? Well, I actually don't know. But while we investigated this, we did find Yevgeny's Instagram and also some videos from YouTube about Yevgeny and his hobbies. That is the Moscow Ring Road, that's a Lamborghini Huracan and an Audi R8. And based on Yevgeny's Instagram, he also has a Mercedes-Benz, an Aston Martin, a Porsche, and a Rolex. <laughs> and just like Karim, also Yevgeny has a motherfucking Rolls-Royce. <laughs> but just like Karim, he's no longer enjoying his Rolls-Royce, because he is, well, he was stupid enough to go on a holiday with his girlfriend and left Russia, went to Czech Republic. He was having a nice dinner in a michelin star restaurant in Prague as he was arrested in the middle of the dinner, and he's in jail in Prague right now, waiting extradition, or fighting extradition. He doesn't want to go to USA, but he will go to USA. So how does this actually work? How are these hackers able to convert stolen information into Rolls Royces? 
Like, like what are we missing? Like, how does this actually, how does the data convert into a fortune? Well, with Yevgeny, we have no evidence that he would have done anything else with the database, with the LinkedIn database, except that he was reselling it for five years, reselling it to other hackers. That's it. Because it's a valuable database. It's 130 million email addresses, 130 million passwords for a premium service. It's LinkedIn, so they are all business users. And there were plenty of people who bought this database, and it wasn't cheap, well, as you can tell. Which then creates the next question. These people who were buying the database, what were they doing with it? Certainly they weren't just using it for like spam email list. It's way too valuable for that. Well, one thing that we do know they were doing with the list was that they were searching the email list for particular type of emails. In, in particular, they were searching for Gmail email addresses. And Gmail is very popular, so you can imagine that out of 130 million LinkedIn accounts, maybe 10% at least has or was using a Gmail address on LinkedIn. So that's 13 million Gmail addresses. Then they use a bot to try to log in to every one of those Google accounts with the same password. They, they try if the user has the same password on LinkedIn and Gmail. And you know what? Quite a few people have the same password on LinkedIn and Gmail. Let's assume, let's, let's put a low ball assume here. Let's say 10% of users have the same password. That would create 1.3 million Gmail accounts. So by buying this database and simply trying the same password, you just got access to 1.3 million Gmail accounts. And Gmail has become the single sign-on system for the whole internet. Gmail is the single sign-on system for the whole internet. I will explain to you what I mean. Gmail never deletes old emails. So if you received an email eight years ago, it's still there. You can still find it by searching for it. So the attackers, once they gain access to your Gmail, will start searching for old emails. In particular, they are looking for old emails that you have received when you registered to an online store. You know those welcome emails that you always receive when you make an account in any online store. So now they know that this guy with this Gmail address has an account in this online store with this Gmail address. Then they can go and try logging in. They can try the same LinkedIn password. For many users, the same LinkedIn password will work even in the stores. But for the users that have a different password in the store, it doesn't help. The password doesn't matter. The attackers will get in anyway because the login page for every online store has a magic button. And the magic button says, I have forgotten my password. And when you click the magic button, it's going to send you a new password to where? To your Gmail. And they already have your Gmail. So if they get your Gmail, they get in everywhere. This is what I mean by Gmail becoming the single sign-on system for the whole internet. Or let, let's put it more generic, webmails. It might be, you know, outlook.com or something else. This is why this information is valuable, because they gain access to people's online accounts in online stores, and then they can start ordering laptops and iPads and Xboxes, and you will pay for them. This is where the money comes from. This is one example. Of course, there's a multitude of ways online criminals make money, not just by st stealing accounts. We've all heard about this technique of making money. Ransom Trojans. And Ransom Trojans started to become a big headache five years ago. Why five years? We had seen some attempts to do Ransom Trojans already before that, but they failed. What happened five years ago? Well, this happened five years ago. This is a Bitcoin. Or actually, it's one-tenth of a Bitcoin. 
don't dare to travel. I do have a one full Bitcoin coin as well, but I don't dare to travel with it anymore because it's $1,200. This is $120, right? Bitcoin was invented six, almost seven years ago. Or blockchain was invented, and then Bitcoin based on that. And Bitcoin is the online equivalent of cash. Bitcoin isn't good, Bitcoin isn't bad. Just like cash isn't good or bad, it's a tool. Cash is used by normal people, by all of us. But especially it's used by criminals. Criminals love cash because it's anonymous. And exactly for the same reason, online criminals love Bitcoin because it's anonymous. So in the real world, for example, most of the real world truck trade is done with cash. It's kind of hard to, to go on the streets and buy cocaine with a credit card. Or so I've been told. <laughs> exactly in the same way, if you want to buy drugs in the online world, you have to pay with Bitcoin. So I've been told. Now, the thing that works so well for online criminals with an anonymous payment mechanism are ransom attacks. And it could be ransom trojans, but it could be anything else. It could be hacking a company and uh, threatening to make it public unless they pay bitcoins. Or launching a denial of service attack and wanting bitcoins to stop it. Ransom in one way or another. Because now there's a way for the criminals to get the money without getting caught. Because we can't follow the money. When they were getting their payments any other way, we could always follow the money. That's why they were using money mules, like man, people who were moving money for them. We could easily find them, but we couldn't find the real criminals. But then they switched to Bitcoin because we can't follow the money. So this here is DMA Locker. Infects your Windows laptop, overnight encrypts the laptop, and then it mounts all of your drives, including your cloud storages, and encrypts them. So if you take backups to the cloud, it's going to encrypt your backups. And if your laptop is a work laptop, it's going to mount all the network drives at your workplace and encrypt everything that you can write to in your organization's network. And now we can all take a moment and think about how much would we encrypt in our organization's network if we would get infected. And then it asks you to pay four bitcoins to get your files back. That's roughly 5,000 euros. So how do you get infected by DMA Locker? Well, you get infected by receiving an email. In this case, an email received by the human resources department of a large company. Because they have this guy, Cameron R. Chandler, looking for a job. So he sent his resume. And in the resume, you can read, it says, this resume has active content. Please click Enable Content. And when you click Enable Content, then you get his education history and his training history. And you also get infected. Because this button, the Enable Content button, is the button that will infect you. This button will execute code from within the Word or Excel or PowerPoint document. And when you shape the message like this, this resume has active content, please click enable content. It's no wonder people click the button, especially when things actually then work when you click the button. But this is only a social engineering trick to try to make the user click the button that he shouldn't be clicking or she shouldn't be clicking. And I've spoken with my friends who work at Microsoft and I've told them that I think that they should rename this button. I think they should rename it from enable content to infect my system. <laughs> Maybe then people would consider twice before clicking on it. But this is the number one way of gaining access or, or, or becoming infected by ransom trojans today. Emails. Your work emails. It used to be web. 
two years ago, it was still the web. Exploit kits on the web. You would go to a website, it looks normal, looks like it did yesterday, but it's been hacked. You don't see anything that it's been hacked, but there's an exploit kit there which will then exploit the old version of Flash or Java or something in your browser. But over the last two years, these enable content tricks in uh, Word, Excel, and PowerPoint have become the most commonplace way of getting infected. There's another bu button in Office which is very similar, which is enable editing. And clicking that is nowhere near as risky. You see the enable editing button quite often. You download any document from the web, it will, it will always show you the enable editing button. There's also a security warning there, but it's not really that risky. Enable content is the risky one. You should never click on enable content. And I wish I would know what enable content and enable editing is in the Estonian version of Office. I don't. In Finnish version, it's ota sisältö käyttöön. Ota sisältö käyttöön. Don't click ota sisältö käyttöön. Don't click enable content. Don't click whatever it is in Estonian. I'll promise you next time I, I come over, I've checked what it is in Estonian and I will tell it to you. I'm assuming there is an Estonian version of Word. Yes, thank you. One interesting development in the world of ransom trojans that we saw in January was that we found a ransom trojan called Popcorn. Fairly common, typical ransom trojan, encrypts your files, asks for one bitcoin. But if the victim is, a, let's say, a home user who doesn't have one bitcoin, which is $1,000 or $1,200, if, if he doesn't have that kind of a money, this ransom trojan will give you your files back for free. You will get your files back for free if you infect two of your friends. <laughs> and that's brilliant. I mean, think how creative these guys are. That's really thinking out of the box. It's like combining a chain letter and a ransom trojan or a, you know, a pyramid scam and a ransom trojan. It's hard to be angry at these guys when they are so creative. So you can imagine the first victim who doesn't have the money to pay, who's going to infect two other victims. They don't have the money to pay, so they will infect two more victims. They will infect two more victims. It becomes exponential, spreads very quickly. And then when any two of the victims that came from you will pay the ransom, it will automatically unlock your files. You will get your files back for free. All you have to do is to spread this URL. They give you a unique URL. Spread this URL, like post it on Twitter, hoping that somebody's going to click on it and get infected. Because then you will get your files back for free. No. It's, it's, uh, you will only get the files back when you infect two more systems and they pay. Otherwise, you could just make a virtual machine and infect two virtual machines. Two of the victims that you infected have to pay, but then you will get your files back. It's uh, really... Uh, interesting twist of making money with ransom trojans. But this is also a Windows ransom trojan. This has mostly been a Windows problem. Windows laptops, Windows desktops. We have seen two ransom trojan families on OS X. So Mac has been targeted, not nearly as much, but it has been targeted. We have seen um, one ransom trojan targeting smart TVs, locking your television, which is creative. And then we've seen some ransom trojans targeting mobile phones, smartphones, only Android. We haven't seen anything on iPhone. And of course, we haven't seen anything on, on, on Nokia's because nobody uses them anymore. <laughs> so sad, so sad. I'm going to buy the new Nokia 3310 as soon as it hits the stores, the new retro Nokia, 49 euros. Sounds like a great deal to me. No internet, I love it. So, the ransom trojans that we have seen on Android are ransom trojans like this. It claims to be a battery extender. You can download it from Google Play. So it looks trustworthy because it's from Google Play. Now, on Android, just like on iOS, applications cannot see the raw hard drive. They cannot encrypt the drive like ransom trojans on your computers can. They can only see their own data. They can't see the data of other apps. 
So they can't destroy it. So what this does is that it will run, it will then show you messages the next day that it has stolen your address book. It has stolen your text messages. And then you have to pay one-fifth of a Bitcoin to prevent them from making your text messages public and posting your contact list on the internet. So it's like a reverse ransom trojan. It doesn't destroy your data. It makes your information public unless you pay. And my recommendation on ransom cases is to never pay. Don't pay. Because the more pay, the more people pay, the bigger this problem becomes. We already have over 100 different ransom Trojan gangs competing for customers, victims. This is a very lucrative business. The more people pay, the more gangs there will be. Yes, if you pay, you will get your files back. They do deliver. They don't lie. If you pay, you will get them back, almost always. They, they know they need a good reputation, otherwise future victims won't pay. So my recommendation is to never pay. But if you have to pay, if you don't have backups, if, the, if your backups don't work, then you might have to pay. And by the way, backups are not backups until you have tested them. All right? If you take a backup, it's not a backup until you know it works, until you know you can restore it, until you know it has all the data you need. Before that, it's a, it's a Schrodinger's backup. It might work or it might not work, but you don't know. All right? So make a backup, then make a backup of your backup. Then make a backup so that it, you can recover even if your house burns down. All right? Backups is how you recover from ransom trojans. Make sure you have backups, not just your computer, but also your phone and your tablet. If all this fails and you have decided to pay the ransom, then haggle, negotiate. We've tried this. We did a study on trying to negotiate the price with ransom trojan gangs. Out of 14 gangs that we tried this with, 11 dropped the price. They're ready to negotiate. You tell them a sad story about how you're so poor and you can't pay two bitcoins, so maybe, what do you say? One bitcoin. And they're like, uh, one and a half. So you can actually haggle. This works. That's my, my recommendation. Try to give them a sad story. And these ransom cases with bitcoins aren't just about Trojans. It's also about hackings. So you might get hacked. Your database has been overwritten, or your database, customer database has been stolen. And then you get contacted that, you know, we have your data. We're going to make it public unless you pay. Now, European Union is going to set into effect a new general data protection regulation. This was accepted last May. It will come into effect next May. And one of the regulations that comes into effect next May, May 2018, is that if you lose your customer's information and you haven't taken proper care of protecting your customer's information, EU will fine you. And the fine can be up to 4% of your company's global revenue. 4% of your global, our revenue last year was $160 million, all right? So 4% is a lot of money. For any company, it's a lot of money. And what GDPR will create is that it will cre create a price level for ransom Trojan attackers or ransom hackers. Because right now, when they hack into a company and they steal the customer database and they want ransom in order not to make it public, they have no idea how much they should be asking. They might be asking for one bitcoin or 20 bitcoins. They have no idea. Next May, they will hack your company, steal your customer database, and then they will mail you that, hi, we have your customer database. If we make this public, you have to pay a fine of 4% of your revenue. We will give it back to you 
for 2% of your revenue. How's that? And you go to any CFO in any large company and you give them two options, like we have to pay 4% or 2% of our revenue, they will go for 2%. So this creates a price point, price point for the hackers. Because now we know how valuable the customer data is. It's worth 4% of your global revenue. How are we doing on time? I'm guessing we have to finish by 3 o'clock. If that's not true, somebody will notify me. So we have half an hour. Because I next want to speak about the next revolution, IoT and ICS. Watch carefully. That is a nuclear reactor, and that is a nuclear reaction. It's kind of cool. Let me play it again. That is a nuclear reactor, and next we're going to see a nuclear reaction as the reactor goes critical. Why am I showing you a nuclear reaction? Because it's an example of the kinds of things which are today, of course, controlled by computers. Because this reactor is being controlled by a PLC, a programmable logic controller, which is a code name for a small Linux box. Because these small Linux boxes control everything around us. Every single factory, every single power plant in every single country is being controlled by PLCs. Small Linux boxes. So computers and software control everything around us. I'm a computer security guy. I've been a computer security guy all my life. And I used to think that I'm a computer security guy. My job is to secure computers. This is what I do. I'm a computer security guy. I secure computers. Well, this is no longer true. Because that is being run by a piece of software. The lights are on in this room because of a piece of software. The water is coming out of the tap because of a piece of software. The dinner you're going to eat later today was at least partially manufactured in a food processing plant, which is being run by software. Every company is a software company. Every company is a software company. Our job, our computer security guys, and girls' job is not to secure computers. Our job is to secure the whole goddamn society, because the whole goddamn society runs on computers and software, everything. And that's a pretty big responsibility to be put on a group of geeks and nerds. But this is where we are. I don't think anybody saw this coming, but this is where we are today. The whole society runs on top of these things. And somebody has to secure them. It's not about securing computers. And the IoT revolution really started from factories. It started from ICS, industrial control systems. And now it's expanding into our homes. So any appliance, any device that you use to connect to the electricity grid, like our TVs or our doorbells, all of those are now going online. If we used to plug it into electricity grid, we will now be plugging it to the internet grid. If it uses power, it will go online. And there's nothing we can do about this. The IoT revolution will happen whether you like it or not. Nobody's going to ask you, and you will not have a choice. You cannot avoid buying IoT gear. You might think that, you know, I, I, that's a stupid idea. I'm, not, I'm never going to buy an IoT washing machine. Yes, you will. Because there will be no options. Not today, not, I mean, not for the next decade, but eventually the price of putting a washing machine or a toaster 
on the internet is going to be 10 cents, 5 cents. Which means that the benefits of putting it on the internet don't have to be very large. So what's the benefit of putting a washing machine on the internet? Well, when you're watching TV, you get a pop-up on your phone that the clothes are clean. Okay. Maybe useful. Maybe a little bit useful. What's the benefit of putting a toaster on the internet? Like you get a pop-up on your phone that the toast is done. <laughs> like what the fuck? <laughs> Yet toasters will go online. So why are they going online? Well, they're not going to go online to benefit you, the consumer. You will not even know that your brand new toaster is an IoT toaster. There's no display, there's no features, there's no internet anywhere. You don't even know that it's an IoT toaster, but it's going to be online. Why? Because data is the new oil. And the vendors who make these toasters want to collect analytics. They want to collect data, because data is valuable. Data from one single toaster is not very valuable, but if the price of putting the toaster online is like five cents, it's probably going to be more valuable than five cents. So then they can collect analytics, like how many customers do we have? How many toasters do we have in use in Estonia? How often do our Estonian customers toast bread? What kind of bread do they toast? What time of the day? How often do we have failures? How often do our toasters catch fire? Do we have more toaster customers on the east side of Tarto or west side of Tarto, for example? And if we have less, less customers on the east side, maybe we should advertise more on the east side. Analytics. So things will go online, not to benefit you, but to benefit the vendors. And it's going to be so cheap, it's going to happen. You cannot avoid this revolution by not playing part. You will play part. Nobody's going to ask you. It's going to happen. This also means, and it's already happening, that we will have to accept end-user license agreements and terms and conditions just to use our televisions, or to use our cars. So what is the biggest lie on the internet? The biggest lie is the lie that we all tell all the time, which is, I have read and I agree with the terms and conditions. I agree with the license agreement. No, you don't. No, you did not read it. And if you would have read it, you, did not, you would not agree with what it says. Yet we click Okay, every time. And we know that people lie, because we tested this. We did a test in London where we said a free F-Secure Wi-Fi hotspot, free access to internet. Please accept our terms and conditions, which include that you have to give your firstborn child to us. <laughs> and if you don't have a child, you have to give your favorite pet. Now, I'm really sad that we actually did not follow through. We should have gone and, you know, rang people's door, doorbells. Hello. It's Mikko from F-Secure. We're here to pick up uh, Jamie. Yeah, Jamie, come on. We should have done this. We didn't. Yes, we had that in our license agreement, and everybody clicked OK. Every single person clicked OK. And the IoT revolution will affect even things which we traditionally did not plug into electricity. Let me show you an example. This here is a smart mattress. You heard that right. Smart mattress. You sleep on it and you connect it to the internet. Made by a company in Spain. So they put sensors in the mattress and they put it online. So when you are out of your home, when you're traveling somewhere else, it will report to your phone if your mattress is, is used in a suspicious way. Yes, so it will tell you intensity and impact per minute with your mattress. <laughs> and I am not shitting you, this is a real product. I know it looks like a joke, it's not a joke. And of course it's made in Spain, of all places. It could have been done in Italy, of course, but it's in Spain. <sighs> Why 
I mean, I think it's a prime example of engineers who were too busy thinking how to do this, so they didn't stop and think if they should do this. <laughs> but they did it. So at F-Secure, we regularly scan the whole public IP range. Well, the public IPv4 range, which is 4 to 2 billion IP addresses. And we regularly find IoT things online, including IoT matrices online which is ridiculous. But we keep finding things which clearly are not supposed to be online, like people's homes. And you can imagine setting up your home automation system and then misconfiguring it so that the admin interface ends up on the internet, which means anybody can go and access your home and, you know, turn off the lights, turn on the lights, turn off the alarm, turn on the alarm, look at the camera, things like that. We regularly find factories, we find power plants, Here's a steel mill. Steel mill with 24,000 kilos of steel at the temperature of 1,200 degrees, and there is no password. So anybody, I mean you, can go and start clicking on the buttons, which is a bad idea. And we keep finding vulnerabilities from home appliances. There was two weeks ago, uh, this thing, a dishwasher, had a web uh, directory traversal vulnerability in a goddamn dishwasher. Everything is becoming a computer. No, I have a question for you. When you go and buy a dishwasher, how long do you think it's going to work? Five years? Ten? Fifteen? A meal is expensive, maybe twenty, twenty-five years? Could be. But the question is, now that these have become computers, will it still be getting updates and security patches in 10 years' time, 15, 20, 25 years? Will it? Because software doesn't work forever. Today is the day when Windows Vista dies, okay? It's in my calendar. Vista gets out of support today. I'm guessing most of us aren't running, I hope most of us aren't running Vista anymore. I'm guessing some of you are running Windows XP still. <laughs> but no, no, software eventually gets out of support. Vista was, is, it's, I think, 11 or no, 9 years old. It's 9 years old, it's out of support. You would wish that your dishwasher will not go out of support in 9 years' time. Even better, cars. Like I'm driving an 18 year old car right now. I have a Toyota from, uh, from, from 1999. And I'm still going to drive it for at least a ten, 10 years, I guess. But if it's dependent on updates and patches, how long will they be supplying patches? Because they do patch cars. Here's somebody tweeting about how his Toyota is updating itself while he's driving the car, which is a little bit worrying. <laughs> and we actually saw an example of this three weeks ago. Three weeks ago, Amazon, the second largest cloud provider on the planet, had an outage. They had an outage in their S3 service, which is their storage platform. And it was really interesting to, to watch people report problems in their home appliances because Amazon was down. Like here's somebody who can't turn off his, turn off his oven because Amazon is down. Like his kitchen is getting hot because the oven will not go off because Amazon is down. This is a prime example on like writing the code so that it fails wrong. If the cloud isn't there, then the oven should automatically go off. Now it stays on forever. So we have big challenges ahead of us in this new, bright new world of IoT. And we have already seen security problems. In October, we saw the single largest attack against internet infrastructure, and that was the Mirai botnet, which was a botnet of 120,000 devices, none of which were computers. They were all IoT devices, like security cameras and DVR recorders and heat pumps. And Mirai is a very simple piece of program. It simply scans the internet until it finds an IoT device, then it tries logging into the IoT device with the basic default username and password, like admin admin, root default, admin password, or my favorite, motherfucker. <laughs> you 
It really tries that. I don't know why, but I don't think it's a default password in anywhere. But, but it didn't do anything beyond that. Very simple thing. And it gained access to 120,000 devices. And this problem reminds me of this. To the younger people in the audience, this is a VHS tape player. This is how we used to watch videos before Netflix. And every living room in every home in Estonia had one. You would go to any of your friend's house. In the living room there would be a television. And underneath the television there would be a VHS player like this. And in every living room, in every home in Estonia, the display of the VHS player would be displaying the same thing. In every home, always, it would be blinking 12. Am I right? I'm right. This is what they always sh were showing. Why is it blinking 12? Because when you plug it in, it doesn't know what time it is. And it's expecting you, the user, to read the manual. Because on page 80, of the manual, they will tell you how to set the time. And we never did that, did we? We never did that. So every VHS player was blinking 12. And this is the problem we have with IoT. You can imagine yourself going and buying your home a new security camera, an IoT security camera with 4K streaming. And you take it home, and you unbox it, and you put it on the wall, and you boot it up. Then you install the app, and you pair the phone with the camera, and then you get the video feed. It works. You see the video. It works. Don't touch it. Don't touch it. It works. Don't change anything. This is what we do. Which means we never read the manual, which on page 80 would tell us how to change the default password in our IoT camera. On page 85, it would tell us how to create user accounts so some users can only see the video and then other users can configure the camera. Or page 90, which tells us how to segment the network so that the stream goes to the internet, but the admin interface can only be accessed from within your home. We never do that. This is the same problem as we had with our video players. Same problem. So let me finish by speaking a little bit about governments and governmental activity in the online world. You really got to uh, admire how the Chinese military marches. They're even exactly the same length. Like, how do they do that? But that's what they do. So, I've seen your army march. It doesn't look like this. Finnish army looks even worse. <clears throat> so Russians are active. The Chinese are active. The Americans are active. We know that. We know that intelligence agencies are working with offensive online attacks. We know that uh, the militaries are also working in this space. We see espionage attacks, we see sabotage attacks, like, for example, the Stuxnet attack against Iranian nuclear refinement system, or the Prykarbato Oblenergo attack, which was targeting power systems in Ukraine. We have also seen state-sponsored attacks which were about stealing money. North Korea government was behind the attacks against the SWIFT International Banking Network attack last year, in which they tried stealing a billion dollars from other governments. Think about that. A government tried hacking money, stealing money by hacking from other governments. A billion dollars. North Korea's annual budget for the whole country is four billion. They tried stealing a billion. They failed. They only got a hundred million. It's still a lot of money. There's very few governments on this planet which are ready to go so low that they resort to stealing from others. But North Korea apparently is one of them. Then again, North Korea has been printing fake US dollars for a decade. Did you know that? They have actually national 
money printing presses, printing their own money and printing US dollars, which is like thinking out of the box. <laughs> creative. Once again, it's hard to be angry at them when they are so creative. Let's print their money. Yeah, good idea. So we know who the big players are, who have the best know-how in offensive attacks. United States, Israel, Russia, China. But beyond that, it gets very foggy. And I've called this the fog of the cyber war. What I mean by this is that the power of traditional weapons, like fighter jets or aircraft carriers or nuclear weapons, the power of those weapons is mostly in deterrence. It's mostly in simply having them, not using them. Nuclear weapons are a prime example. We, the mankind, we have used nuclear weapons in war two times in history. Twice. The whole rest of the power of nuclear weapons has been in deterrence, knowing who has nuclear weapons. There's 11 countries on the planet which have nuclear weapons. And then you know not to, not to mess with those 11 countries because they have nuclear weapons. This is deterrence. But when we go from traditional weapons into cyber weapons, we know nothing. We know the big boys. But then, like, what is the offensive online capability of Estonia? I have no idea. What is the offensive online capability of Italy? Beats me. What is the offensive online capability of Vietnam? I haven't got the cluest. I don't know. Traditional weapons, like we can go online and we get the exact count on how many tanks each country has. This information is public. So the power of traditional weapons is in deterrence, in not using them. And the power of cyber weapons is clearly not in deterrence. There's no power in deterrence because nobody knows because of the fog of cyber war. The only power you get out of cyber weapons is using them. To make it even worse, cyber weapons, exploit tools, attack tools, don't work forever. They rot. They might work today, they might work next month, they probably won't work next year. Because systems change, operating systems change, vulnerabilities are found and patched. So if you want to use them, if you invest money into cyber weapons, and if you want to get something back, you have to use them. And you have to use them now, before they don't work anymore. And this is a bad kind of an arms race, the cyber arms race. And I don't believe in cyber war. I don't believe we will ever see a cyber war. Because cyber, for militaries, is just another domain. A thousand years ago, we were fighting wars. We people, we mankind are so nice, we're always fighting wars. A thousand years, we were fighting wars. And a thousand years, the only kind of war we had was land war. Because we had swords and we were hitting each other with swords. Then our boats became good enough that we could actually wage war in the seas. So wars expanded to cover both land war and sea war. Sea war didn't make land war go away. It just expanded. Then we got planes, thanks to Wright brothers. Very quickly we had guns on those planes. So we got air war. Once again, we expanded, now we were fighting wars in land, sea, and air. Then we got satellites and shit, and we got space war. And now we're getting cyberspace war. And we will never see a war which is only waged in cyber. It's, it's one more domain. It's expanding. It's one of the tools. When you're fighting wars in land and sea and air, you always use cyber as well. This is the situation. This is what we will see. So, six months ago, Russia tried affecting the outcome of the presidential elections 
in the biggest superpower on the planet. Let me repeat that. Russia tried affecting the outcome of the presidential elections in the biggest superpower on the planet. It's a pretty big deal, isn't it? I'm not saying that the outcome is only because of what they were trying to do. Clinton might have lost anyway, but this is what they tried to do nevertheless. So let me play this interview clip with President Putin. This is recorded in October, before the elections. This is from Bloomberg TV. And President Putin is asked the key question, who hacked the Democrats? And Putin answers, is that really important? Does it even matter who hacked it? The important thing is the content of the emails. There's no need to distract the public about who did it. There is no need to distract the public about who did it. We shouldn't be looking at who did it. We should be looking at the emails themselves. Once again, fog of the cyber war, trying to meddle the discussion, trying to lead it into a different direction. So we do live, <coughs> excuse me, we do live in a new world. We do live in very exciting times. We are all very lucky to be seeing all these changes, but some of these changes are scary. Some of these changes are going to the wrong direction. We just got out of the last arms race, the nuclear arms race. We spent 60 years in nuclear arms race. And now we're jumping headlong into the next arms race, the cyber arms race. And we might be spending the next 60 years in the cyber arms race. So we have different kinds of threats. We do have foreign governments, intelligence agencies, foreign militaries. We do have the criminals. We do have the hacktivists. And we also have to worry about companies. Because one of the most concrete risks to our data are not criminals. It's companies. Companies which try to collect our information. Companies like Google and Facebook and LinkedIn. Because they make all their money by collecting our data. I told you earlier that data is the new oil. And this is absolutely true. Data indeed is the new oil. Just like oil, data is worthless until it, it is refined. When you get crude oil from the ground, you know it's valuable, but you can't do anything with it until you refine it into gas or something else, fuel. Exactly the same thing with data. Raw data, you know it's valuable, but you can't do anything with it until it is refined. And oil has brought us a lot of money. Estonia has no oil. Sorry. Finland has no oil. Too bad. We lost a tiny bit of country which, in the last war, which was, would have connected Finland to the uh, ice sea. What do you call it in English? Yeah, Mary. The, the, this, yeah, Jämeri is good. We, we were connected to Jämeri before the war. We lost a tiny sliver of land. We don't connect to Jämeri anymore, which means we don't have oil. We almost had oil, but now we don't. But you know who has oil? Norway has oil. Norway is one of the few countries in Europe which has no debt, because they have oil, which is all owned by the state oil company called Stat Oil. And Stud Oil's revenue last year was 82 billion euros. Norway's oil reserves were worth 82 billion euros last year. That's billion with a B. Google's revenue last year were 86 billion euros. Data is the new oil. Google makes all of their money from data. All of it. And they're more valuable than stat oil. Or their revenue is larger than, than stat oil. Data has brought us prosperity, just like oil has brought us prosperity. 
But oil has brought us problems as well, problems like global warming and polluting our nature. Exactly in the same way, data will bring us prosperity and data will bring us problems. If you work with oil, be careful about oil leaks. If you work with data, be careful with data leaks. And this affects every company and every organization because today all companies are software companies. All companies, all organizations are software companies and software organizations, including your organization. Thank you and good luck. Thank you very much, Mikko, for another great talk. Thank you. So, before we all go to strengthen our passwords and privacy settings, uh, let's have a quick uh, panel discussions. And uh, please uh, welcome our panelists. Uh, first, Director of Tallinn Technical University, Jao Kavikso. Head of CERT Estonia, Clyde Maggi. And uh, CEO of SKID Solutions, Kalev Pihl. Please. Never it. trust a guy with a ponytail. <laughs> <laughs> That's what I always say. And of course, Mikko Hipponen stays with us. Thank you. Never trust a guy with the ponytail. <laughs> Especially if he has so, glasses. <laughs> <laughs> the aim of the panel discussion is to help today uh, organizations to better understand uh, the effectiveness of their cybersecurity efforts and give some overview about the state of cybersecurity from Estonian perspective. I have asked from you to prepare a short uh, comment uh, on, on your point of view. And uh, Jaak, maybe you can, uh, you can start and, and open it up and, and uh, comment a little bit what you heard. And, and well, I, I do believe in a way we, we had the wake-up call exactly, almost exactly 10 years ago when the, when the cyber attacks during the bronze soldier nights took place. And I do believe we did learn as a lesson, both on the government level as well as on, on the national level. Whether, whether it, it's been enough, I don't know. What I'm anyhow sure about is that we need lifelong learning concerning cyber threats and cyber security. That will be never enough. I, I, I also believe that, that we've taken serious steps both on the government level as well as, as like people and, and corporations. But if, I mean, if the estimates that concerning, uh, let's say, the password thing that was mentioned by Mikko, I don't really believe Estonia is has a better record than worldwide average, that 10% of us has the same password. So on a very basic level, I think cyber hygiene is, is, is something we have to take care about. But, well, maybe 10% doesn't wash their teeth as well, mm. so despite 100 years of propaganda on that direction. Um, I do have one question which may have reflections from my colleagues. When we take uh, biological uh, objects, people, but also animals, then immunity, immune system, spends almost 
10 plus percent of all the energy turnover. So being fighting foreign intrusions takes 10 percent of our turnover. Attention, money, time, whatever you think about. And I've always thought that we, we should think about this message in the terms of cyber as well. Maybe we have to spend several times more on uh, assuring security, building defenses, renewing, uh, renewing software, um, managing our passwords, so on and so forth. We do believe that it's a marginal cost, mm. maybe 1%, maybe 2%, maybe 3%. But I, I think we have to spend a lot more attention, money, and resources on defending our identity in cyberspace on all levels, national, institutional, personal. If this 10% is right or wrong, I don't know. But my message is that we still do too little as far as resources are concerned. Thank you. Thank you, Jörg. And uh, Clyde, could you please? First of all, <clears throat> thank you for a good presentation. All those topics you covered today was basically exactly what I do every day. So all those topics are very similar, mm -hmm. and Estonia also. But uh, you started your presentation about uh, 2007 uh, cyber attacks in Estonia. And uh, you also uh, was covering the topics about uh, Internet of Things. But my question is that if you look at all those Internet of Things devices, and this is not only that the people are stupid enough not to look at the manuals, page 90 and, and 80, to find out how to secure the devices, but most of those devices uh, manufactured in, in Asia, there is no way you can put some, your own password. Mm. Basically, there's only default password and that's it. And um, European Union and uh, maybe United States also, they are thinking how to regulate or, or standardize all those devices or things that are connected to the internet. Okay, let's imagine if you're if you make some regulation that in Europe or in the United States you cannot buy or connect to the internet things or devices, there is a, not some specific regulations or standardizations on, on those devices, then where are you people buying your webcams? AliExpress, Alibaba, etc. So mostly you're buying those cheap devices, unsecured devices still from, from Asia. So even if you will implement some regulations in Europe and in the United States, there is still half of world basically attacks us mm -hmm. by those devices. So this is not the way we can secure ourselves. So what is, for example, Miko, what is your opinion on how we can protect or what we have to do worldwide mm -hmm. to protect against that kind of devices? Because uh, in 2000, uh, after the 2007, all those DDoS attacks is much more powerful for now. Uh, even uh, companies like Facebook and Twitter were down because of the DDoS attacks. Sure. So probably, I don't know exactly, but probably Facebook have a bigger IT infrastructure than we have in whole Estonia. So we don't have any chance to protect ourselves mm -hmm. against that kind of DDoS attacks. So what future will bring to us? I remember when the Mirai attack started in the middle of October. I was online, it was afternoon, I was in, in Helsinki, and I was Googling for some news item, and I was following the link to Boston Globe, one of the largest newspapers in the USA. And Boston Globe wasn't loading. I mean, I got only part of the page, no pictures. It was broken, and it was weird. I was reloading it, and it doesn't, doesn't work. It looks like Boston Globe is down, and that's a pretty big deal. So I decided, okay, let, let me look at Twitter, if other people are reporting the same. And Twitter didn't load at all. So they were like, holy hell, okay, there's an attack. And then we started looking at the, the uh, network charts and we saw a massive attack against the DNS infrastructure of the second largest DNS provider on the, on the planet. So how do, we, how do the vendors who build these IoT devices, how are they going to fix it? Well, the answer is they will not. They will not voluntarily fix it. Because the most important selling point for home appliances is price. When you go and buy a washing machine or a security camera, you're looking at the price. You're not asking questions about, like, what's the firewall in this washing machine? Like, does it have intrusion prevention technology? No. Nobody asks that. Everybody's looking at the price. So these vendors would be stupid 
if they would be investing money into cybersecurity because nobody's asking for cybersecurity and it would only increase the price, making you less competitive. So they are not going to fix this voluntarily. So the only ways out is either certification or regulation. Certification could be self-certification. And I know that Linux Foundation is actually working on a IoT self-certification framework right now together with IoT vendors. And if that works, it might actually be the way out because every single one of these IoT devices is, is running Linux, which is, which is kind of cool because Linux is Finnish. I mean, it turns out Linux is bigger than Microsoft eventually. But nevertheless, the, 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 the self-certification, or then if that doesn't work, then regulation. We already regulate, you know, electrical safety of our appliances. You must not get an electric shock. It must not catch fire. Why don't we also regulate security? Not just safety, but security. Um, so either one of those is, is going to happen, I, I think. Yeah. Thank you. I think there is... ...secures our identif <laughs> <laughs> yeah. identities so, than, than you. Yeah, I think that the thing that is different in Estonia. We, we don't log into government report, at least uh, with the Google account, so which, True. which is great. And uh, it happens in a lot of countries in the world. Um, but I think in, inevitably the thing that you were discussing is that the world is going to the direction where you have smarter devices and dumber users. Mm -hmm. And that's kind of has been the uh, uh, way we have taken for years now. And um, the interesting part about the, the discussion today and, and then the talk you had for me was that I was thinking about the fact that the data today is valuable or the oil mm -hmm. thanks to the fact that it is used to manipulate people who are the intelligence creature at the time. Right. So, and in the beginning or in the middle somewhere, you talked about the eye uh, that is coming. Mm. And uh, I was thinking that whether, first of all, I don't believe that it will be so powerful that it won't have faults. We have the greatest uh, intelligence in the um, kind of universe as far as we know, yeah. but we have faults mm. and we have small viruses and that can actually beat us. Mm. And, and therefore, most probably the next level will also have some faults, but will the data be also in a 10 or 20 years used, be used actually against the eye and actually kind of manipulating that in a similar manner because it also has its biases and it takes this kind of a, at least a goal for itself from somewhere. Mm. And if you manipulate the goal, somehow it probably acts differently. Mm. So how well are we prepared to actually those kind of manipulations and uh, what will happen in, the, in those devices. And those devices will actually twist mm. themselves against each other. The difference between us and the machines <clears throat> is that all the features we have is the outcome of millions of years of refining and becoming better. I mean, and, and the weak dying out and only the most beneficial genes surviving. Uh, so we are constantly making ourselves better. Over millions of years, this is where we are. And AI is going to do the same. It's just going to be accelerated by a million times. It's going to make a better version of itself, which will make a better version of itself. In 10 milliseconds, it has gone a million years. So it's not going to be faultless, of course, but it's going to refine itself in speeds that we can only imagine. And that's going to be the big, big differentiator. But it's, 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 it's very hard to see the real benefits and problems that we will get from that. It, it, it's, it's exciting and scary at the same time. But I really liked the part about devices getting smarter and people getting dumber. I, I will steal that. <laughs> okay, uh, I have one question uh, from, uh, from our, our Twitter and as we have at the moment we have more than 600 uh, viewers uh, as this the event Hello. is uh, fly <laughs> Hello, everyone. There uh, is live broadcasts. But um, the question is here that uh, what would be at the moment? What would be the top IT security-related question the organization leaders should ask themselves or from their IT security people? Mikko, would you like to answer that question? <laughs> sure. <laughs> well, I think the first, it's all already mentioned in the question, but it's sort of the first stepping 
stone is that it really has to be a question for the management of the company and not just the management. Today, cybersecurity is a board level issue. It has to be a board level issue. If you are working in an organization of any significant size, it has to have a CISO, Chief Information Security Officer. Because I told you earlier that companies rarely fold because they get hacked or there's a breach, but they do get into very serious problems. And thanks to GDPR, there's very significant, significant fines if you don't do this right. Because right now in many organizations, this is very reactive. At board level, they don't really think about IT systems at all until something happens, like, you know, Ashley Madison is in the news, and then they scramble for a couple of weeks and then forget about it. It has to be a board level agenda. In large companies, there has to be a board member who understands these things. I think that's the starting point. Okay, thank you. Now is the time to involve you as well. Uh, does anyone have a question? Uh, we have a microphone there running around. Just raise your hand if you have a question and, and you, will, you will get this opportunity. And you can also ask your questions in Estonian or Finnish. <laughs> yes. While everybody's waiting, I will have a quick Please. question to Miko maybe about the uh, normalization of things. If you look at the news feed that we have today. Mm -hmm. So basically these like one billion and, and half a billion uh, Yahoo uh, attacks, uh, mm -hmm. those are normalizing to some extent the, the fact that everybody is hacked on a daily basis. Sure. So when do we lose the sensitivity about those things? When do we actually say, that, well, it doesn't matter? It's, that's a very good point. And it's probably happening already. And we've only seen the very beginning of this because right now you only hear about the data breaches coming from the United States. Because USA has legislation that companies have to tell the customers when they lose their data. This will ha start happening in Europe next May with GDPR. Right now, when a company loses your data, they will not tell you. Even if they lose your credit card number, they will not tell you because they don't have to tell you. Next May, they will have to tell you. And then we will know about data breaches and we will become un unsensitive to this. Because when you have a large enough network, when you have a large enough organization, there's always a breach somewhere. So, how many of the Fortune 500 are hacked right now? Answer, 500. Maybe a question to Clyde very quickly then, that uh, out of those who you get to know about, how many of them actually get published in Estonia? This is not really our business to publish that kind of no, data, no, but... No, <laughs> just that how many uh, organizations are ready to publish anything like that? Uh, more and more. And uh, this is a good way because uh, Let's say five years ago, the company mostly wanted to to hide the information that we had something bad happened and the incident happened, so on, so on. But right now, uh, the companies will admit that yes, there was a problem. Yes, we got hacked, and uh, we are getting better and better not to get hacked next time. And uh, this is uh, that kind of tendency is shown in, in worldwide also. This is not shame to get ha hacked because everybody gets hacked every day. That's the normalization. <laughs> well, most probably there's a need of legislating into, into if, if any third party damage is done through breaches, mm -hmm. the, the responsible company or organization must report that. Mm -hmm. I think that is, that is very clear. But I'd, I'd have a, a little bit of provocative question. When these uh, cyber attacks uh, took place 10 uh, years ago, there was a there was a, almost a global debate of the potential threats and growth of cyber, uh, cyber crime and, 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 and breaches, attacks, and so on and so forth. And um, in a way, there was a feeling that the, there will be an exponential growth over time. But I, I do have an impression that the, in whatever terms we measure the extent of attacks, it's rather constant and exponentially growing. I understand that there's very little data available, mm. but can there be any estimate what the trends are? Are they really, you know, growing linearly or even exponentially? Or is there, let's say, the global criminal turnover of all these, uh, these cyber crimes is more or less, I don't know, 0.1% of GDP or 1% or of GDP? Can any such kind of estimate be made? Computer security doesn't always fail. Like we don't always fail. Um, in, in, in fact, computer security systems are getting 
significantly better all the time. If you compare to where we were 10 years ago and where we are today, it really is like night and day. You look at the operating systems we were running 10 years ago, like XP and Vista, and you look at the security feature of latest OS X or latest Windows 10, it really is like night and day. We have tons of built-in uh, security features in the operating systems themselves. S security software has be become much, much better. We would be in great shape with today's technology if we were fighting the enemy we had 10 years ago. But we don't have the enemy from 10 years ago. The enemy keeps on changing. So it's a never-ending race. And the attacker, attackers have uh, an upper hand in the sense that they can always look at our defenses and try to find ways around our defenses before they launch the actual attack. So they have access to our weapons, but we don't have access to their weapons, which, which makes it a challenge. But uh, it is not exponential. It is not getting out of hand. We are able to fight back. Um, we're not winning the war, but we are in the fight. Let's put it like this. There is always, well, quite often, the people thinking that uh, something hacking me, something, that someone scanning, some bots and scripts and etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera. You have to remember that behind every attack there is a human being, mm. some hacker or criminal. So in our case we have, I don't know, maybe not 90, but at least 70 or 80 percent of all our incidents are basically cyber crimes. So we have to put more effort to the catch those guys. We can't endlessly secure our houses with a bulletproof uh, window and doors and put hundreds of locks to the doors because of the, someone throwing the bricks to our house. We have to catch the guy yes. who's throwing those bricks. Excellent. And show the example. I mean, if nobody gets caught and guys are buying Rolls Royces with their profits, of course it's going to get worse. But there's another other problem that I think is important, and it's a, it's a psychological or a social, a social problem. Namely, I, I, I still do believe that too many of our co-citizens think that uh, cybercrime or cybercriminals are kind of lesser criminals than, uh, than uh, really, really um, let's say, aggressive, uh, physically attacking criminals. And this... These are rather smart guys, kind of Robin Hoods, and if they do, sometimes they do good things and, and, and raise uh, at least emotional support among people, telling that, okay, big banks, we have to take the money away, or the governments, bad governments, we shall take the money away from the bad governments, and so on and so forth. So I think there's, there's, there's some mentality problem as well related to cybercrime and cybersecurity. It's somehow considered a... a a more elegant way of criminalism than, mm. than just attacking and robbing people on the streets. True. Now we need to get a question from the audience. Come on. <laughs> There's a question. Please, Please wait for the wait. microphone so for the Second. stream. So I have actually two questions. Uh, one is very short only for Mikko. We are Estonia, internet voting. Internet yes. voting? Yes or, or no? No. <laughs> Thank Bad you. idea. <laughs> so the next one is... Uh, uh, Mira, let, 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 me, let me expand a little bit. Okay. Yes, please. I don't like online voting. I don't like digital voting. Even though I'm a big fan of digitalization in general. I mean, I'm a geek and a nerd. I love digitalization. Uh, but I only love it when we have a problem that needs solving. We had elections in Finland yesterday. Not the big election. We had the communal elections. The voting place is closed at 8. I was voting 10 to 8 myself. We had the final results 10 after 10 in the evening. It took us two hours, 10 minutes. If we would have done digital voting, we would have gotten the results in five minutes. I don't think waiting for two hours and 10 minutes is a problem. I don't think it's a problem that needs solving at all. And when you move elections from traditional method to online method, you expose your, the bedrock of your, your democracy, democratic system to all sorts of problems for no for us, let's say, put, let's put it like this, for small benefits. There are benefits, but I think they are smaller than the potential downsides. So, in all of places, I don't think voting really needs digitalization. That's my view. Okay, thank you. So, the next one is, of course, Mirai Botnet. In order to create it, you had to exploit the vulnerability in it. Okay, so it attacks you. Is it okay for me to exploit again and turn it off? 
So hacking back. Ah, oh, right. To write a good virus, you mean? Yeah, yes, yes, yes. yes. So yeah, Mirai. Well, Mirai wasn't really exploiting a vulnerability. It was just using the default password. We don't think that's a vulnerability. It's not a coding error. It's just the default password. So yes, if if Mirai can log into those systems, you can log into those systems, and you can write a script which logs into the same systems and removes Mirai. And that would be what we call a good virus. And these good viruses are always a bad idea. There's actually been an uh, academic study into this. Yes, you, you could do it, but they typically create more new problems to, by uh, problems like uh, co um, compatibility issues and, and, and other things. And then you have also legal liability, which nobody wants to take. We have seen some good viruses over the years. Some hackers have done this. Uh, for example, um, what was the ISS worm spreading on Microsoft to internet servers? like 10 years ago. Somebody wrote a virus which would remove them. And some I actually saw a prototype of a good virus which would scan the net to find these Windows ISS web servers, infect them, um, reboot the machine, uh, install remotely Linux on it, <laughs> and then Apache, the web server, and then restore the website. So you, your server would change from Windows running ISS to Linux running Apache, but the website would still be there, and the admin would be very confused in the morning, <laughs> wondering why is it so fast. That's great. Question here. So you talked about the, the one big uh, big uh, change is uh, artificial intelligence and the other very and touch a little bit another very big change that is uh, blockchain. So what in the long run the, the blockchain will do? Great question. Um, blockchain is one of those innovations um, which once it's explained to you, it seems obvious. Like of course, like what's the innovation here? Of course, that's. I mean, and that's a sign of a great innovation, because it wasn't obvious until somebody invented it. And the idea is, is, is very powerful. The idea of a, a public ledger or a public database of transactions, which is maintained by a peer-to-peer -peer network, which means it's always going to be online, it can never go away, and the public transactions can never be changed. Like whenever you add a transaction, it's always there and it's always public. Like one way that Bitcoin uses this is that when we move money, these transactions are there, they're always there, they're always public, they can never be changed again. But you can use blockchain for tons of other things which have nothing to do with money. Um, last month, I saw a clever idea from Bosch. Bosch builds electronics for many places, including cars. And they have a, a prototype of a system which fights the odometer fraud in, in used cars. When you buy a used car, it's going to tell you that th this car has been driven 50,000 kilometers. And you're always wondering if, if the seller bought the car and then turned it back by 20,000 kilometers. So they have a blockchain maintained by the cars. The cars are online. The cars regularly, well, they, they maintain a blockchain amongst the cars themselves. And then the car, once a week, sent, like, how many kilometers do I have? They put it in the blockchain which is public, everybody can see it, which can never be changed because it's a blockchain. And even better, it's maintained by the cars themselves, which means you don't need a cloud service, you don't need a server, as long as you have two cars on the road. Like 50 years from now, if there's still two cars, of that type of car still running, you still have the blockchain and you still have the odometers. It's going to work exactly as long as it needs to work, which is a brilliant idea. I, I don't know if, the, if this is practical or not, but it's a, it's, a, it's a great way of, it's a great in, exp, explanation of things that you can do with blockchain. And of course, my favorite part of blockchain is that we don't know who invented it. Like, it's a mystery, which is neat. There's one more remark. And there are people who, who've been uh, speculating about the possibility of using the blockchain uh, technology to increase uh, credibility in the society at large. So anybody who wants to be trustworthy may um, record his or her statements sure. because it gets a timestamp and the, the fact is fixed forever. Sure. So if you want to be a trustworthy person, you report from time to time what you are doing and what you are thinking and you build a credibility over time to all customers and, and you can change that. So if somebody is not using that and they say maybe he has something to hide. It is a dangerous social experiment, I would uh -huh. say, but, but there, is an, there is an element of, of interesting conceptual terms that if you want to stick to truth and only truth, 
the only way is to have all your locks of whatever you undertake uh -huh. uh, fixed in a blockchain technology. Right, and, and it can also be used to fight corruption. Uh, another example of what blockchain is being used for is that there's one, one country in Central America, uh, the name of maybe, I'm not going to name the country because I'm not sure which one it is, but they have a problem with uh, s people's land getting stolen because the land records are very easily uh, modified by corrupt politicians and corrupt officials. So people are you know, thrown away from their own land because this is not your land, this belongs to my cousin, says the politician. So they're putting the land record in a blockchain which is now public, cannot be modified. Every time you sell a piece of land, it, that's put in blockchain, which means they can't take away your land, which is a brilliant idea once again. Thank you. Please. So I absolutely have something to hide, uh, being paying attention to what's happening in the States recently. I went to the UK a couple of months ago, and before crossing the border, I factory reset my smartphone. So why did you... Did I have to do it? Why do people, people think it helps? And can we expect anything like this in Europe? Yeah, we're living in a uh, we're living weird time, uh, especially in USA right now with this situation with President Trump and the different restrictions they are putting into place. I've been to USA twice since Trump was elected. I didn't see any anything different in crossing the border, but it is worrying. And if somebody would. I mean, I've been stopped at the US border many times over the years, but uh, nobody has ever prompted me to, for example, give my password. And if I would be prompted, I wouldn't. I wouldn't give my password, which means they would most likely deport me and maybe ban me from returning, which is what I would do. But I wouldn't give in. I can't give in. I mean, there's so much incriminating st stuff on my laptop, I would never give away my password. I definitely have <laughs> things to hide. But, uh, well, there is one Twitter user, at least, uh, who looks for counter-argument to I have nothing to hide. So, what it would be? Uh, we know that, well, there is two problems, security and privacy. We, we already have found a lot of uh, counter-arguments uh, for security. If, I don't know, grandmother is saying, well, there is only my pictures, who wants to steal those? But how about privacy? I don't have nothing to hide. What we would Edward Snowden put this very nicely. He said that it's as, it's as if you would say that, you know, I have nothing to say, so I don't need freedom of speech. <laughs> right? Very good. But nicely put. <laughs> Thank you. We have a question from there. And then so so uh, another one to uh, Mr. Hipponen. Uh, you said that uh, your phone was on the tracking list for... Uh, on two uh, intelligence agencies. Uh, so how did you come to know that uh, they are on the tracking list and which two are they? <laughs> <laughs> they are from the United Kingdom and from the United States. And they, uh, one of them became public through the Snowden leaks. I'm actually listed on the GCHQ wa watch list on the, on the Snowden leaks. The other one I will not comment further, but it's from USA. Okay, and uh, we have one from here question, and then back there. It's mm -hmm. a question about uh, government's database syncing. I had a friend who went to USA, but uh, he was uh, 10 years ago illegal there and uh, left the country because he, he had a, like a leak hole that uh, the board ladies didn't check her password. So he got out of the country of USA and now he went back to USA, immigrated, and uh, there was, to apply the visa, he said no to every question that, have you been in US, have you been illegal? And uh, he got the visa, but he, should, he shouldn't have got the visa. Good. Good. <laughs> <laughs> um, what was the question? The question is that uh, when are the governments going to sync the data between ah. each other and uh, like uh, different uh, countries in US? Right. I mean, sometimes we are too worried about privacy risks affecting us from our own governments or from foreign governments. We have to remember that they are governments. They're not very good at doing anything. <laughs> so, 
they might be they might want to be able to do more, but it's 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 governments and IT systems. Typically, the projects are long and go over budget and never finish. So many of the things that they would probably like to do, they aren't able to do. Maybe maybe not yet, but. And then there's another question about uh, hardware security. If I buy a device device from Asia, maybe there's some Trojan inside the motherboard already because years ago I had a friend who told me that uh, he had a theory to hack into a PC, which he did, and he changed the voltage of the PC and burned it down. So what is the risk if I buy a Samsung phone that somebody will hack it in and blow it up? Oh, I'm sure we can trust the South Koreans, come on. <laughs> um, maybe not the Chinese, so Huawei, yeah, well, that's, that, that would be maybe more problematic. But then again, when you start on that path, um, Every single one of our computers is running a CPU from either Intel or from AMD. That's the two options you have. They're both completely closed sources, completely closed architectures, and way, way too complex for anybody to understand what's in the CPUs. Fun fact, Intel has chip fabrication plants around the world, but every single one of their CPU plants is physically in the United States for reasons that I don't know. It's probably not the cheapest place to do them. Nevertheless, they do them in USA. So is it possible that there's some sort of a uh, backdoor on CPUs which US government could enable at times of crisis? Of course, it's possible. It's possible. I don't know. Lots of things are possible. Is it plausible? I don't know. But sometimes I do wonder. Well, Following, following the same idea, for very many military acquisitions by American companies, they use components only made in USA for understandable reasons. So there is a, is a deep concern in, in the defense industry that, uh, that you, you'd rather, better don't trust something that's produced outside the US. And the other way around. Chips. And the other way around. I, I think we have to be realistic uh, that uh, that uh, you shouldn't trust 100% the big producers in, in the US. You'd rather be prepared that there may be something. Another question, of course, is that whether we tend to trust big multinational companies than we do trust our own governments, which is a little bit of an oxymoron, for me at least. So I, I still believe that the governments, in principle, are not that... that uh, malvolent as, as we tend to believe. Rather, it's the other way around. But, I mean, you all must be wrong. Thank you. Uh, unfortunately, our time is running up. Uh, we have time for last questions. Please. Päivän kysymys Suomeksi. Tämmöinen filosofinen kysymys. Onko olemassa ennaltaehkäisvää turvallisuutta, vaan kaikki vaan lieventävää turvallisuutta? Great question. Is, is all the data security uh, like is it always reactive, or can we predict and, 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 and be ready for unknown attacks? Well, I work for a security company, so we think about this question a lot. Um, and this is especially critical when you think about the toughest attacks, the most complicated attacks to block. So, for example, like foreign intelligence agencies. Think about like the largest intelligence agencies on the planet with their multi-billion dollar budget and uh, latest and greatest technology. How could we ever hope to defend against attacks like that? And when you think it through, there are ways of fighting with predictive technologies. If we try to be reactive, like try to block known attacks, that's going to fail. But we have developed what we call digital judo. And those of you who have done judo or other martial arts know about movements where you use the attacker's movement and force against himself. And there are ways of doing this in the online world as well. Um, one example I can give to you is that we've built a reputation database of websites, URLs, register keys, network streams, and applications. So, for example, we not only know that these applications are good and these are bad, we also know that this application is very common. It's being run by people all over the world. And this is very rare. It's only being run in one country or only run in one company, for example. And we can take this to extreme. So when, when attackers 
write their attacks, they know that if they make a completely unique attack, which nobody has never seen before, security companies have a hard time blocking it because it's unknown. And this then turns into a situation where the victim gets hit by a piece of malware, which is tailor-made for the victim. It's made for him only. And in that situation, our security product would try scanning it. It would find nothing because it's an unknown app. We wouldn't find anything good or anything bad from the app. But we would prompt a user saying that, hi, you just tried executing this application, which we've never seen before. We can't find anything bad from it. However, you are the first person on the planet to run it. Nobody has ever run this anywhere. And this is highly unusual. So we, we are, we're going to block this because it's so rare. And this is judo. I mean, this is the, the more they try to avoid our detection, the more they tailor make a unique attack for every single victim, the better we will block them. And I like defenses like that, where we use the attacker's attack against the attacker himself. So it can be done. Thank you, Mikko. Thank you. That's it. Our event is over. Thank you for panelists. Uh, thank you, Mikko. Thank you all here and there. I hope to see you again quite soon. Depends on Mikko. All right. Thank you, <laughs> thank you very much. Thank you. Yeah.